Hey guys, welcome to this quick lecture on the structure of an academic paper. Um, in this video, I'm going to go over really a very basic structure for any standard academic essay that you would ever need to write an essay with an introduction, body paragraphs that support a thesis statement, and a conclusion. Um, in the video, I will emphasize um, you know possibilities or talk about like what students have done in the past or what I might do as a student um, in the profession analysis paper so while I am going to emphasize the specific assignment that you're finalizing this week this structure is knowledge that you can take with you regardless of what type of paper you have to write so the first thing you want to go over is obviously the introduction. Um, first sentences in your introduction, you're looking at your hook, your sentence, uh, your hook sentence, your attention grabber, and there are some things that you can do here, some characteristically common things that a lot of students do. You can present um, a shocking fact or something that's surprising, something that's like like really interesting to you maybe. Um, you can tell a story. I think that for the most part the, the consensus is to you know make sure that you don't put I anywhere in your paper and that's certainly the case for um, this paper here. So if you're telling a story it should be something about someone else. It really shouldn't be a personal story. Now I've I've had students ask me, is it okay if I tell a personal story because I think I have something really relevant and I think it it, it goes well here? And, and my answer is generally yes because um, there are definitely scholars who put in a, a quick personal reference at the beginning of their papers, but you have to make sure that you're doing it for a purpose and that um, when you include I, and, and again, in a very, very limited way, um, it's not to back up any kind of argument, it's just to introduce ideas and kind of explain the context of an argument, say. You can ask a question, It's this isn't my favorite um, form of a hook sentence, but I don't think it's a terrible one. Whatever question you ask, you just need to make sure that if you don't directly answer the question by the end of your paper, your reader has a better understanding of how they themselves would answer that question. Um, and then something else that you can do to start your papers is, is give a quote. This is my absolute least favorite way for students to begin a paper. Um, that's why you see an asterisk here because I think the problem with it is a lot of students will just pull a random quote that isn't very meaningful um, and then jump into an introduction and had that quote been left off, the introduction would still be just as good, if not better. So um, the asterisk is, is here to kind of just remind you, if you're going to begin a paper with a quote, that quote needs to be referenced again somewhere else in your paper, not copied again, but you have to come back to it in some way. Your reader has to understand the value and merit of that quote being incorporated into, into your introduction. It can't just be like a, a name drop type quote. Um, it has to be connected very strongly to the content somewhere before you end that paper. Um, once you've given your int your introduction's hook sentence or attention grabber, you can move into background information. Essentially, the essential question that you have to answer in this middle section of your introduction, and this is the part that students say, you know, they have trouble with, that they need help like developing their introduction. What does your reader need to know in order to better understand the ideas that you'll present in your body paragraphs? And so for the specific purposes of your profession analysis paper, the, the things that your reader needs to know is kind of, there's two big parts. Your reader has to understand um, what primary source you're looking at. And so in this case, it's good to just provide a very short summary of your movie or your TV show. But they also have to understand why you're analyzing that primary source. So it's important to provide um, some, in, like, of a mention of the profession, um, somehow 
make it clear by the end of part B here, this background information, make it clear that you're looking at this profession um, with an, like, an inquisitive eye. So that I think, you know, making sure you identify the profession and summarize your primary source are the two things you have to do in your background information to write a successful introduction um, for this paper. The last sentence, and what I, I want to um, clarify something as well, the thesis statement, which is the last sentence of your introduction, it doesn't have to be just one sentence. It certainly can be, but you know, does your thesis, can a thesis statement be only one sentence? No, it can be more than one sentence. Um, you know, if you took my English 111 course, then I generally asked for you to only write one sentence. However, as your writing gets more elevated and your papers get longer, and you'll realize this the further into your um, education you get, but when you're writing 20 page papers, you might find that you need two sentences to fully encapsulate the claim that your paper is making and how you're backing that up. So um, your thesis statement can be more than one sentence, but for the most part, I find that my students can um, push out the thesis statement in just a sentence, and that's all you need. Your thesis statement is the main idea of your essay, so whatever your argument is, that needs to be very clear in your thesis statement. Um, it needs to reflect the structure and ideas presented in your essay. So if your essay covers topics X, Y, Z in that order, then your thesis statement should present those kind of, I would call them focal points, X, Y, Z in that order. And then the other thing I want to talk about briefly is that your thesis statement has to be a statement can't be a question. A question is not an effective thesis statement, um, but your thesis statement has to make your claim, make your argument, state the main idea, but not be a statement of intention. So I want to spend just a couple of seconds talking about what a statement of intention is. That's a statement that says something like, this paper will discuss, or this paper discusses, uh, the accuracy of surgeons as portrayed in Gray's Anatomy. The problem with this is by reading that sentence as a reader, I still don't know what your argument is. So if the paper is going to talk about accuracy, then are you arguing um, that it is accurate or is it not accurate? It's unclear. Okay, so the student might say, okay, well, could I write a sentence like, this paper will explain that surgeons portrayed on Gray's Anatomy are not accurate. That's better, but there's no reason to say this paper will, or in my essay I will write about, or this essay discusses. Just state your thesis statement. So avoid that kind of phrasing that references the paper itself. That's something you do not want to do in a thesis statement. It's just not effective. Um, and it doesn't, you know, the things I'm saying here are very interesting because at some point in some genres, this type of writing is appropriate. However, for this paper in the MLA formatting, um, this sort of like writing about film and TV lit kind of stuff, it's not appropriate here. So I just want to clarify some of those things for your thesis statement. I think you can fit um, in one sentence a very effective thesis statement. However, if you need two sentences to write your thesis statement for this paper, that's, that's perfectly fine. Okay, so I want to talk about the body paragraphs and um, I'm talking here about very general body paragraphs. There is a video that you've already watched on comparative analysis and how to structure a comparative analysis. That's the type of writing you're doing for the profession analysis paper. The comparative analysis paragraphs follow this body paragraph structure. So I'm just going to go through them very quickly. Um, and again, I want you to understand that the body paragraphs I'm discussing here is just 
any generic body paragraph you can apply this so if you're also taking a history class and you have to write a history paper if biology asks you for a paper if you're taking a film class and they're asking you for a paper this is the structure for a body paragraph that you can follow no matter what okay the first sentence it's called a topic sentence a topic sentence it's similar to a thesis statement um, but the difference is a thesis statement is the main idea for your whole entire paper a topic sentence is the main idea of the specific paragraph you're writing right there in that moment um, and it usually is going to have sort of like a keyword or a key phrase that's repeated in the concluding sentence of that paragraph um, just to kind of frame your paragraph so you'll see a and c here topic sentence and concluding sentence a picture you know you have your your house you have a picture it's in a frame the frame is your topic sentence and your concluding sentence your topic sentence should always be written in your own words don't ever begin a paragraph by doing any of the following don't start a paragraph by quoting someone else's ideas don't start a paragraph by paraphrasing or referencing a source um, you can do that in the very next sentence but just hold off your topic sentence should be your words alone so then you're going to have something like, and I say second through fourth sentence here, does that mean all body paragraphs only have something like uh, six sentences? No, that's not true at all, but um, it's a, a good estimate. So in the middle of your paragraphs, whatever is not the first sentence and whatever is not the last sentence, you're giving supporting details. There are many different types of supporting details and some of them are appropriate for some papers and not appropriate for the other so um unless you're writing like a personal narrative then a personal story about yourself is not going to be appropriate but if you are writing a personal narrative it could be okay um, if you think about this paper one of the questions that i get a lot from my students is if i work in this job can my experience count as evidence or support for my arguments? My answer is no, because you want to be as objective as possible and bringing yourself and putting yourself as support for your argument really blurs the lines between an effective argument versus just you well an ineffective argument because just because you had this experience doesn't mean enough there needs to be more objective forms of comparison here in your comparative analysis paper um so this middle section of the body paragraph is just how you're supporting your main idea how you're supporting your topic sentence because that's the the main idea you can use examples, quotes from research, explanations, elaboration, logical reasoning, facts, statistics. Again, refer to the comparative analysis video for specifics on how to do this. In your scene suggestion paragraphs, it's all about summarizing that scene and breaking down what you're seeing there. In your accuracy argument paragraphs, you're pulling out your source material and you're saying okay you know this is accurate look at all this proof to support that and then you're going to end on a concluding sentence and that's the main idea of the paragraph um, rephrased recapped again try to use that keyword and another thing same with the topic sentence don't quote don't paraphrase the concluding sentence should not be a quote um, and you want to end on your own words so it shouldn't be any specific detail. It should be an, going back to the main idea, big, broad concept, overview style. Again, think of a picture frame. The picture has all of the details, the colors, the specifics. The frame is just holding it in place. And that's what your topic sentence and your concluding sentence are doing. The conclusion is the paragraph that I feel like a lot of students have questions about how they can better develop their conclusion. Um, and I think when I was a student, it was the paragraph that I struggled the most with because I always had this feeling of, well, the paper is over and I'm done writing. Why do I have to write a conclusion? I've said everything I have to say. Um, and, and so with knowing those two things, I want to also say, for me, the conclusion is the paragraph where you have the most freedom to just kind of say what it is 
it, let's say I, I didn't have all these restrictions and requirements in this paper and you have to write, you know, this many words and it has to be so long and use these number of sources. What would you have just said in a nutshell to make this argument? And that's what your conclusion is. So to make sure that that happens effectively, somewhere in that paragraph, restate your thesis statement in a new way. You know, don't just rewrite it in your conclusion word for word the same that you wrote in your introduction because you just wrote this whole paper and your conclusion should take that into consideration. So rephrase your thesis statement, restate it in your conclusion. But then make sure that you're answering this question, so what? Why does what you've written matter? What's the purpose for telling this story or relaying these ideas? So for um, specifics to the profession analysis paper that you're writing, go back to the purpose and or the audience that you mentioned in your research proposal because that's the so what point. For example, if you are writing this paper because you want to make sure that uh, future students don't go and watch this movie and then say, oh, I want to become an airplane pilot or whatever because it looks so glorious or wonderful, that's your purpose for writing. You're trying to, you know, maybe present a warning that the job has more than you see on screen or um, maybe your goal is to encourage people to get into this job like it, it really is as accurate as you see here so whatever your purpose for writing is that is very closely tied with answering the question so what so really spend some time thinking about that and i think that you'll figure out what you need to say in your conclusion your restatement of your thesis doesn't have to be uh, the very first thing. It doesn't have to be the A. These really should just be bullet points instead of do this and then this, A and B. Okay, um, so the other thing that I like to talk about with my students, particularly, and this is very specific to the profession analysis paper, for me I think that there's one very uh, formulaic and repetitive method to organizing all of your body paragraphs. You know, so if we're talking about the structure of an essay, we've focused on the structure of individual types of body paragraphs, but how about when we have to put the whole thing together? Of course you start with your introduction, of course you end with your conclusion, but what about all the body paragraphs in the middle? Um, and I think there's two organizational methods, although there are probably many, many more than that, but I'm lumping a whole bunch into one type. So. For the profession analysis paper, where your goal is to show scenes um, and like topic type scenes um, of a movie or TV show and argue as to whether what you see on screen is accurate or not, specifically regarding a profession and how like, you know, if someone's performing their job or what it's like to have that job, then you start with your introduction and you pick the topics and you just alternate back and forth. So for example, under method one, you will see the introduction and then you will see a comparative analysis segment. First, show that scene, write your body paragraph for the scene analysis. It's on the first topic that you're writing on. Then tell me, is this argue it? or is this accurate or not? Argue about that, use support, you know, in all the ways that you would, same topic. And then you just go into the next topic, show a scene, is it accurate or not? Next topic, show a scene, is it accurate or not? And you'll notice that these are just chunked out in paragraphs. So scene is a paragraph, accuracy argument is a paragraph. New topic, scene is a paragraph, accuracy argument is a paragraph. New topic, scene is a paragraph, accuracy argument is a paragraph. This method is for someone who is very formulaic, you like that um, nice chunked out structure that is somewhat repetitive, your reader 100% knows what to expect. If I were a student writing this paper and I had chosen very good topics to analyze or worthwhile topics to analyze where I had a lot of content and a lot of stuff to say, method one is how I would organize this paper. I think it's possibly the easier organization. But that's not the only way to organize the paper, and it's not 
it's not even necessarily the best way. It's just the way that makes sense to me. Um, there are other very effective ways that I would organize my paper and if I thought about it and then also students have organized their paper. So I want to talk about the different scenarios where method two might come up because method two is a little bit random so um, I'm adding these different types of organization in here but you wouldn't necessarily have to follow them exactly as you see here. You would just tailor it to whatever is going to work best for you. Same concept with the introduction and the conclusion. The introduction comes first, the conclusion comes last. That's never going to change here. But let's say you have a situation, and here I'm looking at body paragraphs 2, 3, and 4. Let's say you have a situation where you have two different scenes that go really, really well together, but they're not necessarily um, showing the same thing. Or alternatively, you have one scene that's showing two different aspects of the profession, but it's happening right there in one scene. So it doesn't make sense to talk about that scene, move away from it, analyze your accuracy, go to something else, go back to that scene. It's more effective and more clear for your reader to just cover the whole scene right away. And so that's where you can have two different paragraphs coming into play where you show the specific parts of the scene that are relevant to one topic, move on and show the other parts of that scene that are relevant to the second topic, again assuming these are kind of connected, and then write a paragraph on art on accuracy for both topics one and two. So this again, this paragraphs two, three, and four that you see here would be a situation where you feel like you have more than one scene showing effect, something different. Uh, you have one scene showing two different concepts, but they're so closely linked that it doesn't make sense to talk about them separately. Um, and then I just go into, like a, again, a standard comparative analysis. There's one scene and one accuracy argument. But with body paragraph number seven, this is a situation you might run into as well, where you feel like you have a scene to analyze and you feel like you have an argument to make regarding accuracy, but you don't really feel like you have enough content to push that out into two different paragraphs. So for you, it might make more sense to just bundle it all together into one paragraph and that's perfectly fine. And then you can go on to you know, another regular scene analysis, accuracy argument, comparative analysis segment with your final topic. Here in method two, you see that you have less um, body paragraphs, but you still have five topics. You're still covering the same amount of content. Just to kind of show you some examples of that, here's this very repetitive formulaic organizational method one. So let's say you're analyzing the profession of a detective on some show. You write your introduction. Then you have a scene where you show the detective talking about the case with their family. That's all a paragraph. You know, here's the detective doing this. Uh, you have topic sentence, concluding sentence, and you're summarizing that scene. Move on to the next paragraph. Now you have to figure out an answer to this question. Well, in real life, do detectives talk about cases with their family? And then, you know, say, well, whether they do or not, this scene is accurate or this scene is inaccurate. Then you move on to a new topic. Maybe that new topic is gathering evidence, and then you ask yourself, you know, what role does the detective play to crime scene? Move on to new paragraphs and new topics. Um, you might show the luxuries that the detective has, car, clothes, house, and then ask yourself in a follow-up paragraph, well, is this accurate? Do detectives really make this much money? Again, move on to a new topic. This is my next topic that I selected randomly would be something like, um, you know, the desks, the desk job, office duties of detective work and comparing that to the reality, you know, how real is the desk job version of the detective that they see on screen? Are they ever at their desk? Are they, you know, is it accurate? Is it not? Moving on to the final topic and then into the conclusion. So again, very formulaic, very simplistic. Um, method one works for you if um, you have a, a number of topics that are all of equal value and equal weight that you want to address slowly throughout your paper. 
Then we have organizational method number two, and I feel like this is the one that needs a little bit more explaining. So again, introduction to start, conclusion to end. Um, what about those scenes that are connected? So here, I thought, could I have a paragraph showing a scene where a detective is gathering evidence from the crime scene, and then a follow-up paragraph where the detective is processing evidence at the lab, and then my accuracy argument is, okay, how much do detectives actually handle evidence? Because here I see them gathering evidence from the crime scene and processing that evidence. Is that even accurate? So for me, in asking this question, paragraphs two and three, that topic, those scenes are very much connected to each other. Then I can move on to a standard scene suggestion, accuracy argument, comparative analysis. And then maybe I have a situation like this. Maybe it's not that I'm noticing my characters in my movie or TV show doing something. Maybe it's that I'm noticing them not doing something. Now, in this case, I don't have a scene to talk about. I just have this statement that I figured they'd be doing more paperwork, and I don't see them ever doing paperwork. So because I don't really have much to say, that shouldn't be its own paragraph. So I'm just going to tie that right in with my accuracy argument paragraph and analyze how much paperwork real life detectives actually do. In this example, I go back to that standard comparative analysis with two paragraphs, a scene and an accuracy paragraph, and then I jump into my conclusion. So I, I feel like the bolded things that you see here in this example, organizational method two, are really the um, items that you're most likely to come across that are a little bit unique and wouldn't follow that standard comparative analysis segment. Um, I hope that this video has been helpful in helping you kind of figure out that you have a lot of freedom in organizing this paper, um, but you still have to follow the conventions of academic writing. So if you have any questions, definitely let me know. I also want you guys to, if you haven't already or if you need a refresher, make sure that you check out the comparative analysis video. It's probably going to be helpful for you to um, maybe go back in and watch that MLA video so that you have all of the citations and stuff correct. If you have questions, definitely let me know. Otherwise, I hope you guys have a good week.